Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Tonight's Bible study, we're going to be going through Matthew chapter 10, in which we're going to look at uh, Jesus sending out the 12 apostles. So before we dig in, why don't you uh, bow your heads and let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time that we have to uh, come together and study your word. Um, thank you that we, we have the freedom to be able to do that. Thank you that... Uh, um, Thank you for the people that are choosing to take the time um, to be able to study your word. Lord, I pray that you will um, be here in our midst, teach us something about uh, your character, about your disciples, uh, and about uh, Jesus. Speak through me. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Proud this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome, guys. Well, um, Man, I am sick of politics. I am absolutely sick of politics. And that is not a segue into the talk. Uh, I wasn't, I mean, there's, I suppose I could find some belabored way of tying the talk on sending out the 12 apostles with politics, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to um, talk about what Jesus talked about. But I am sick and tired of politics. Um, and as we're filming this, we're filming this on Tuesday. Um, I still have yet to go and vote. I will be doing that. Um, but I am very jaded by the whole system right now. Uh, I personally feel that uh, the system does not represent me in any way whatsoever. Uh, I don't have um, a party. I don't have uh, anybody that, that I feel like I can vote for that, that represents me, that I'm excited about representing me to the world. Um, and I, I don't know if anybody has ever felt that way about a politician. I, I guess some people have. And I guess I am rambling. So I will leave the politics and uh, I will stick to what I know, which is the Bible. So uh, let's open it up. So we are going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 10. So why don't you flip over to Matthew chapter 10 with me. That's 11. Hi, Lexi. How are we doing this morning? I'm just sniffing the perimeter. She's not looking for attention. She's looking for... Uh, sp oh... I know what it is. We did a uh, cake smash in here uh, yesterday, the day before that. We did a first birthday cake smash. Uh, and the kid, we, we, bring, we roll out the paper, um, the white paper from uh, up top, and then the kid went to town. And oftentimes with our cake smashes, uh, which we, we don't do that often because they are a lot of work, um, but often what happens is the kid just makes an absolute mess and I roll up the paper, but uh, no doubt the residue of the cake is now on the carpet. So we're going to have Lexi wandering around, sniffing the carpet throughout the entire uh, talk. Hi, hi, yes, there's no cake. I'm sorry, Lexi, there's no cake. You can smell it though, can't you? It was good. It was a homemade cake. Um, okay, so yet another tangent. I apologize. Okay, so what we're going to see here is uh, what I want to do is look at the, the term apostle. Um, now, by definition, apostle simply means uh, one sent out, one sent. Um, so when you look at apostle, it's not a term that we use uh, today. Um, we, we look at disciples as, as a term, and discipleship is a common term. Uh, looking at the term apostle, um, who is the first apostle? Uh, I would say that Jesus is the ultimate apostle. He was the one sent out from God uh, to proclaim the gospel. Uh, so Jesus is the first apostle. Uh, then you have the 12 apostles who we're going to see sent out right now. Um, so why don't you pick it up with me. We're going to do um, 10, 1 through 4, and then I'm going to talk for a bit. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Uh, Thaddeus also went by Judas, uh, and he was James' brother. Uh, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So, uh, in looking at this, we have uh, a list of the 12 apostles. Now, each of the um, uh, Gospels does, each of the testimonies of the, uh, the different takes on the Gospels, um, 
We see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, we see uh, a list of the 12. Uh, Matthew, we have 10, 2 through 4, which I just mentioned. And Mark, you see Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 16 through 19. Luke is chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. And then we also see them listed in Acts 1 through 13. Now, uh, I'm referencing from this. This is the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Um, I just recently got this for my birthday. I got the full set, which is a gig gigantic series of books. Uh, 60 pages on Matthew chapter 10 alone. And I will say, it's not that riveting of text. It, going through it, I enjoy it, I really do. Uh, and, and the classes I'm taking right now, right now I'm taking a class on uh, hermeneutics and uh, exegesis in the Bible, which is basically uh, how we study and what we study in the Bible. And there are some texts where it's just so daunting to go through and read, where it's just like, oh, it's like my business law class for my MBA which is like seriously case study after case study. So at any rate, um, I, have, I went through this and I've pulled out some great information here. So um, the interesting thing is, is that when you, when you compare the four different times that they have all of the, the, the apostles listed, Peter is always listed first. Simon Peter um, is always listed first and Judas Iscariot is always listed last. Um, this implies a few different things. Um, one, we know why Judas is last. He's the one who betrays Jesus uh, to the um, Sanhedrin, and uh, because of that, obviously, um, the, uh, the cross and, and Jesus' passion starts because of Judas. Um, but Peter is clearly um, kind of the head of the group. Um, Peter is... Uh, of, I love Peter. I absolutely love how um, Peter is just so gung-ho. He is so, um, he's like me a lot of the time where I definitely, uh, when I get excited about something, uh, you know, my mom used to always say the term, um, David pulls the cart before the horse. Uh, and in some situations, I would say, I don't even worry about having a horse. I just pull the cart myself. I just am so excited about something that I just go after it. And I love that, that we see that character of Simon uh, Peter um, in the Gospels. And we'll see that as we study him more. But there's some other interesting things. Um, in each least list, there are three groups uh, of four, right? So each group is headed by um, Peter, Philip, James, um, are the heads of the groups. Um, it, this suggests it does not prove that the 12 were or organizationally divided into smaller groups, each with a leader. Um, the commission in Mark 6-7 sent the men out two by two. Um, perhaps this accounts for the pairing in the Greek text in Matthew 10, 2 through 4. I don't know if you noticed that, but there was always ands. And the first two pairings are brothers, so it's a logical pairings, but it seems that they were paired in that way. Um, but let's talk about each of these guys. Um, I'm just gonna skim through my notes here to give you guys some information on these guys. So Simon Peter, he's a native of um, uh, Galilee. He and his brother Andrew were fishermen and possibly disciples of John the Baptist. Jesus gave Simon the name Caiaphas, which uh, in Greek means Peter. Um, Peter is impulsive, uh, ardent, and Peter's great strengths were his greatest weaknesses. Andrew is Peter's brother uh, and not nearly as prominent. Uh, in the New Testament. Um, evidence shows him to have been quietly committed to bringing others to Jesus. We do see that in uh, a passage, in several passages. James and John. James was probably the older. Uh, he's almost always appears first when you list the names. But he became the first um, martyr, and that's in Acts 12, 2 that we see that. Um, and I'll hit on that in a second. Um, the brothers were sons of Zebedee the fisherman, whose business was successful enough to employ others. His wealth may have helped account for the family's link with the house of the high priest. That's referenced in John 18, uh, 15 through 16, as well as for the fact that he alone of the 12 apostles uh, stood by the cross. Um, these two brothers, James and John, uh, whatever their source, they had the nickname Sons of Thunder. Um, it reveals something of their temperament. Um, John was undoubtedly a special friend of Peter. 
Um, and it's reasonably reliable uh, tradition places him after the fall of Jerusalem in Ephesus, where he ministered long and useful uh, into his old age, uh, taking a hand in the uh, nurture of leaders like Polycarp, uh, Papias, and Ignitus. Um, and that's John. We'll hit on him when I um, uh, pull up my next text that we're going to talk about. Um, then you have um, James, son of Alphaeus. Um, it's possible that, so uh, Matthew, whose name is Levi, was also called, his father was called Alpheus. And if this is the same Alpheus, then James and Matthew um, are another pair of brothers in the Twelve. We don't know that for certain, but there's a potential of it. Um, you have Thaddeus, who also was Judas' brother of James. Um, I think he preferred to be known as Thaddeus after Judas um, Iscariot let his true character be known. Um, Thaddeus comes from a root roughly signifying the beloved. Perhaps the uh, apostle was called Judas the Beloved. Um, uh, he was distinguished from the other Judas and the apostles. Uh, um, only John 14, 22 provides us with information about him. Simon the Zealot. Um, the Zealots were uh, nationalists, strong upholders of Jewish traditions and religion. Some decades later, they became a principal uh, cause of the Jewish war in which Rome sacked Jerusalem. An important thing to note there is that you have Simon the Zealot, and then you have Matthew the tax collector. Matthew the tax collector uh, sold his loyalty to his fellow Jew uh, and made money from the Romans. He was a Roman stooge. This is the reason why um, Jews could not stand tax collectors, absolutely hated them because they sold out their family and um, their, their culture uh, to make money. So Matthew very much would have been seen as um, a, a Roman stooge, so to speak, and yet, amongst the 12 at this point, you also have Simon the Zealot. Now, he's a zealot, which means that the idea here is that he is, there's your tie into politics today. We definitely do have zealots on both sides. I think there's probably a few more on the, the crazy uh, Trump side, although um, Salish and I used to live in Portland, Oregon, and some of the liberals that are in downtown Portland still occupying downtown Portland and protesting nonstop are very much zealots on the liberal side. So you have zealots, which are just far beyond absolutely uh, nuts into what they believe. Um, and so Simon was a zealot in favor of Judaism and against Rome. And as this says, uh, in the coming future, it's the zealots that instigate the um, Romans to uh, the Jewish war in which Rome sacked Jerusalem. So I think the dichotomy between Matthew and Simon must have been palpable. It must have been very, there must have been some tension there. But no doubt they had the common um, element of Jesus. Uh, and his teaching united all of them. And that's a good lesson uh, on the political side, is, is that um, whether you're a liberal or uh, a conservative um, or somewhere in the middle, Jesus unites all of us. And all of us have to deal with our sin issue, and Jesus is the solution of that. We are all um, one race, one mankind. Um, okay, then you have Judas Iscariot. Um, Judas was the treasurer of the Twelve. Um, but not an honest one. Um, Matthew and Mark add the damning in indictment who betrayed him. So whenever they list off um, the 12, you always see in, in, uh, in Matthew, uh, and I think it just said Mark, um, you see them list when they say Judas, it is always, they add in uh, Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Okay, let me just check my notes here. Um, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so we have the 12 chosen by Jesus. So Matthew just went through and chose these and, and, and listed these guys off. <clears throat> now, personally, if I was choosing uh, the 12 to be the foundation of my church, I would not have chosen these guys. I definitely would not have chosen these guys. I was thinking about that the other day as I was reading through this. Um, 
I would have done it a little differently. I would have gone with more like the Avengers. Uh, if you think about it, if, if I am going to start a movement, I need to have uh, several people that are of uh, strong religious persuasion. So I would have probably gone to the uh, seminary, uh, the Jewish seminary, the equivalent of it, uh, the synagogue, and I would have gotten um, well-spoken, well-read, well-respected um, believers in God that knew the Torah very, very well, but I would have also gotten, I would have made sure that I had um, some muscle because we're going to go up against the Romans. We're going to go uh, and get thrown out of town. So we need some some big, strong muscle men. I also honestly would have gotten some, uh, uh, some beautiful people because people listen to beautiful people for whatever the reason is. Um, if you're pretty, people listen to you for some reason. Uh, then you have, um, who else would I get? Let's see, we need the brains. Um, so maybe um, uh, whoever was... Uh, the head of the Jewish chess club, let's say, hypothetically. I, I jest, but the idea being is, is that the 12 I would have gotten, that, that anybody would have, would have chosen, uh, in modern times, you would get the, the people who have these massive followings that have thousands upon thousands of people who are followers because they already have uh, a following to go off of. Why is it that Jesus does not choose um, the, the really smart, the really... Um, well-known, the uh, rich, why does he not, that's another, if I was going to have in my group, I'd make sure I had at least um, one person who was really rich because money does help, especially when you're trying to uh, sway votes, uh, as we see that the only way you can really become president is if you are a multi-multi-millionaire uh, because you need the money to be able to swing votes. Um, and so on yet another tangent, um, but the, the point simply being is, is that this is a very unique 12. So why does he pick this 12? Let's flip over to 1 Corinthians 1.26. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, 26. I didn't put my marker in again. I do that so often. Hi, Lexi. Um, 1.26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, but many were of no, uh, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. What does this mean? If you, from Jesus' perspective, if he were to have um, some really well-known politician or some really well-known uh, Jewish rabbi uh, or someone who was uh, very eloquent at speaking and was an amazing orator, uh, if he were to choose... Um, someone like that, their pride would get in the way. Pride always gets in the way. And here's another question is, is that if someone who is great does something that's great, well, is it their greatness or is it God? Which was it? So Jesus chooses these 12 because they're nobodies. They're fishermen. And that's the big point that I want you guys to look at. We are, we are, we're transitioning in Matthew. The, the 12 have been selected, and we are now going to enter a, a, a period, basically through the rest of Matthew, where we're going to see this ragtag group of blue-collar fishermen go from these normal simpleton guys to being these amazing, amazing men of God. And the one thing I want you to keep in mind, and this is through basically the rest of the study of Matthew, is what changes them? What is the thing that changes them? We're going to study in the coming weeks and, and months, really. You're going to see the true character of the apostles. And you're going to see, and I love this, I love the fact that when you look at the apostles, you see they're normal, everyday guys. And you see that by the questions they ask and the things that they do. And we're going to see this 
uh, over and over and over again. Uh, Jesus is going to give some great lesson, and then the guys are going to be like, hey, Jesus, we're just curious. When, when we get up to heaven, who's going to be the best? Who's, who's, who's the best of us? And Jesus is like, guys, no, no, you don't get it. And there's, there's so many more stories like that where the apostles, before Jesus goes to the cross, are just, they're just, they're normal, everyday humans. And they are. They are. The apostles were all humans. They are all fully man, right? Um, but then after Jesus' death, something changes in these guys. Something changes drastically in these guys. And we're going to see that. And I'm very excited about that. So we've only made it uh, four verses. So we're going to keep going because I want to get through all of ten. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. I'm on Matthew 10, verse 5. With these instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So what does that mean? What is he saying here? What he's saying, Jesus is saying at the very beginning of the expansion of the church, the church being the, the believers in Jesus, the very first group that Jesus wants the 12 to talk to are Jews. And in fact, when you look at Jesus' ministry, he's almost always speaking to the Jews. Why is that? They are God's chosen people. They have the whole Old Testament, which to them is just Scripture. They have all of Scripture points to Jesus. It points to the coming Messiah. So they have that foundation. But through the Jews, you have the blessing of the entire world. So he focuses first on the Jews and then the Gentiles, which, what is the difference? What is a Gentile? A Gentile is simply a non-Jew. From the Jewish perspective, that's the two groups, that's it. You're either a Jew or you're not. And if you're not, then you're a Gentile. So when we're looking at this, Jesus is saying, first, don't worry about the Gentiles. Don't worry about them right now. Specifically, just go and speak to the Jews. Um, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. That's the Jews. As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the same message that John the Baptist uh, was giving, and this is at the very beginning of Jesus' message, um, his message as well. Um, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. The idea there is be a blessing to that house. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. A lot of people use this as um, a call out to disciples or missionaries, is that when you go and become a missionary, that you should go, that you should just go. And don't have any money, don't get paid, don't have any food, don't worry about anything because God will provide everything for you. And then when you go, stay at people's homes um, and then be a blessing to them when you are staying in that home. Some people use that. I don't know um, if, if that's necessarily uh, how you uh, missionaries, um, if the calling should be that way. Uh, but that is specifically how Jesus sends out the first 12. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. That's interesting, is that you're going to be flogged in the synagogues. You're going to be flogged in the churches. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Through you. And we're going to hit on this. Um, one of the things that you're going to see 
after Jesus um, has his passion and, and dies on the cross and is resurrected and then appears to the 12 as well as um, 488 uh, others, um, you're going to see these apostles change drastically. These unschooled blue-collar fishermen are going to astound um, the, the, the educated uh, religious elite. Um, these apostles are going to go in front of the Sanhedrin, the same group that condemns Jesus. They're going to go in front of the Sanhedrin and they are going to amaze them with their knowledge. And they're going to notice these unschooled, educated men were with Jesus. But let's continue on. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not to be above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? Now, let me explain that real quick. Beelzebul, Beelzebub, uh, it's another term for a demon. <clears throat> and what he's saying here is, is that they're going to call him, Jesus, uh, a demon. And what, what that means is that it's, it's by demons that Jesus is casting out demons. Um, the Jewish, uh, um, the, the Pharisees accused him of that. And so what Jesus is saying is that if they accuse me of that, they're going to accuse you of that. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are, all, you are worth more than many sparrows. <clears throat> okay, so this last little chunk, basically from 21 to here, paints a bleak picture. Paints a very bleak picture. But I'm, I'm going to make it even bleaker. So, uh, hi, Lexi. Yeah, yeah. You like Fox's Book of Martyrs? Is it a good book? So Fox's Book of Martyrs is a very, very old text. I didn't realize how old this is, but the original uh, Fox, when he wrote this, um, he wrote it in 1563 was the first edition of this book. 1563. It's pretty nuts. And what he did was um, John Fox... Um, he was so overwhelmed um, by people who were dying for their faith that he wanted to put together a book um, that was all about all of the believers who were martyred uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. So he did that, and he started it in 1563, uh, and he, in his lifetime, uh, had four different editions, I believe. Um, and the thing that's pretty scary as you go through and read this is that there were a lot of people who died at the hands of religious leaders, religious groups. Um, the religious elite was killing people um, because uh, they didn't believe exactly what uh, those in power believed, uh, whether it's the, the Catholic Church uh, the Church of Rome, uh, or you had um, monarchies as well in England as well that would kill um, kill people, um, and and it's amazing looking at the different stories, um, and it still holds true to this day. It is something that you can open up and you can read and you can hear these stories of people who died for their faith. Eleven of the twelve. Um, not including Judas, I don't put him in that group. Um, you could put uh, uh, Paul to replace 
uh, well, that's a whole other discussion. But all but John are martyred horrible deaths. Uh, I'm just going to fly through this really quick. Um, so James, uh, a son of Zebedee, uh, he was the first of the 12 apostles to be martyred. Um, he was ordered to be executed by the order of King Herod Agrippa uh, in AD 44. Um, his extraordinary courage impressed one of his um, guards, Cap Capturisto, uh, it's basically a guard, such a degree that he fell on his knees before the apostle, asked his forgiveness, and confessed that he too was a Christian. And because of that, uh, he was beheaded alongside James. James was the first of the 12 um, to be martyred. Next, you have Matthew. Uh, he was pinned to the ground and beheaded with a halberd in the city of Nabda. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in around AD 60. James, who is Jesus' half-brother, um, according to uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, the high priest Ananias ordered James killed by stoning. Uh, there's also another um, uh, take on that where he was um, thrown off the top of a temple tower and didn't die from that, and so then they stoned him after that. Um, then you have Andrew. He was martyred in Adicia uh, and was crucified on an X-shaped cross, which is where you get even today now. It's St. Andrew's cross is an X. Mark, uh, he was dragged to pieces uh, by the people of Alexandria uh, when he spoke against their idol, Saparis. Uh, Peter, um, he requested that he be crucified upside down. He was going to be crucified, and he did not want to be crucified in the exact same manner as Jesus. So he uh, was martyred on a cross upside down, and he died that way. Paul, uh, Paul was in prison quite a few times, and, and from that time in prison, we get uh, his epistles. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were his first imprisonment. Uh, his second imprisonment, we get uh, um, uh, Second Timothy, um, and he was uh, beheaded uh, AD 66, just four years after Jerusalem fell. Uh, Jude was crucified at Adesia. Uh, Bartholomew, um, his pagan enemies cruelly beat and crucified him. Thomas, he was tortured by angry pagans and run through with spears and thrown into flames um, of an oven. Luke, um, he was martyred by being hung from an olive tree in Athens uh, in AD 93. Uh, the Apostle John uh, is accredited with found founding the seven churches of Revelation, Sir Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, uh, Laodicea, uh, Tharda, um, the uh, Theatira, excuse me, and Ephesus. Um, he was arrested and sent to Rome, and he was cast in a large vessel filled with boiling oil that didn't hurt him. Boiling oil didn't harm him at all. It was a nice warm bath for him. Um, they released and banished him um, from, uh, Emperor Domitian did this, to the Isle of Patmos, which is where he wrote um, and had the, um, the vision in which he wrote the book of Revelation. He died uh, AD 98 and was the only one of the apostles to escape a violent death. <clears throat> and that is just the beginning of this amazing book of martyrs. And people continue to this day um, to die for their faith. It's such wonderful, warm-hearted conversation, isn't it? So let's continue on. Uh, we have a, a good chunk still to go. Um, we are on 1032. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. 
whoever loses their life for my sake, will find it. <clears throat> it's some, some harsh words that he's saying, but the point here is that God's got to be your number one. Jesus has got to be your number one. If you want to change, if you want peace, if you want joy, if you want eternal life, you got to put Jesus first. And the inner turmoil that you will experience if you believe in Jesus but don't let him lead you, um, and that, that, I think that that is the daily life of a Christian, is this battle inside of, of letting go, of letting Jesus truly be uh, in the driver's seat, uh, submitting to him. And when you do that, only when you do that, are you able to, uh, is Jesus able to work in you? This, the, the statement that he says about um, father and mother and, and division, it, it, it's true. It is true. Is that if you do put Jesus first, you are going to make enemies. And it might very well be in your own household. There's a lot of Christians that I know very, very well um, who... They, they're in bad, bad um, uh, relationships with their family members specifically because of their religion, because of their belief in Jesus Christ. It divides people. It divides families. And Jesus is saying, yeah, it's going to. And that is his intent, is, is that you need to choose a side. And it's harsh words, but you got to decide which is more important. For me personally, uh, I've been a Christian for 20 years, and I talked about this earlier, is that the first year... Uh, of my um, being a Christian, I would go to uh, church. Uh, it was a college group. I was a freshman in college uh, on Thursdays. I even played in the worship band for a bit. Um, but I would go out and I would live a totally different lifestyle. And um, that absolutely exploded on me. And you have to choose. You can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't um, say that you believe this and go out and, and, and live a different lifestyle without it blowing up in your face. Although I would argue there are many people who, who have gotten quite comfortable with it. On Sunday, they go to church or watch online or even don't do that, but profess to be a Christian, but really aren't um, because they haven't put Jesus first. Very harsh words, very strong words um, today. But the, the main verse, the main takeaway um, is this passage Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Pride. Pride gets in the way. If you think you're all that, pride, it gets in the way. Um, and that's what he's talking about here, is that those who find their life will lose it. But those who lose their life, die to yourself and follow Jesus, you'll find it. You'll find joy. You'll find peace. The world makes so much more sense when you just follow Jesus. It honestly does. So let's, let's continue here. Uh, we are on um, 1040. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Some people think that, this is, that he's talking about um, taking care of children, that, that you, you need to take care of kids and that Jesus will reward you if you take care of kids. That's totally true. But uh, what he's saying here, he's, when he talks about little ones, that doesn't quite translate right. He's talking about um, almost infants, uh, uh, my apostles that are at the very beginning is the idea. Uh, my chosen 12, my kids is the idea, is that if you take care of them, you'll be blessed. So here's a question. You are going to see as we go forward in Matthew, as I mentioned, you're going to see it happen multiple, multiple different times um, in which the apostles are going to do things where you're just like, really? Really, guys? I mean, come on. You're the chosen 12. You should get this. And even, even uh, you're going to see Peter, uh, the stone, the rock, Peter, who is going to deny Jesus um, the night that uh, Jesus is betrayed uh, and taken. Uh, he's going to deny that he even knows Jesus to a slave girl 
to a, a small little insignificant slave girl. He's going to deny Jesus. This guy that is Peter that becomes the rock of the church, who gets crucified upside down. What changes? Jesus. They see him die on the cross, and then he is resurrected, and he appears to them again. And what you see after that is 12 apostles, Judas excluded, but you see a fire and I, that, that, that burns in them that they take to, to their, their death. They are so uh, on fire for Jesus when they, they see he truly is God that he did defeat death. And this is one of the, the reasons why, one of the strongest arguments for the resurrection actually having taken place in my mind is the fact that these 12 fishermen that are timid and shy and nobodies, after that point, they get the Holy Spirit and they help spread the word of Jesus. And the church grows like wildfire after this because it's true, because it's absolutely true. If it was a lie, if, let's say hypothetically, um, that the apostles came to the tomb and took Jesus's body uh, to prove in their minds that uh, he did actually rise, to, to, to claim their argument, that he did say that he was going to rise from the dead three days later. And so the Romans feared that, the Jews feared that, they feared that the apostles would come and steal his body. Let's say hypothetically that they did do that. Well, would they have died for that belief? No, not all, no, no, absolutely not. Not the way that they were tortured, I mean, at least one of them would say, okay, okay, we made it up. We made it up. We actually took him uh, and buried him somewhere else because uh, they would have been released. They would have been uh, uh, freed from whatever the, the torture they were going through, but not one of them recanted. And they were changed people because they saw the resurrected Lord. They knew nothing on this earth matters save for Jesus. That is the only thing that matters. It's powerful stuff. It's absolutely powerful stuff. So when we continue on in looking at Matthew, keep an eye on that and, and look at, at, at how these apostles um, change. And then we'll hit on that again when, when we get to the, the latter portion of Matthew. We'll hit on that again. So why don't you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh my gosh. Thank you for um, your word, for these apostles, for these first 12. Thank you, Lord, that you picked simple, uneducated, normal, everyday people. Because of that, I have hope. In looking at who these guys are and the mistakes that they make, I can relate to them. And I have hope in knowing that you work through the foolish and the simple to confound the wise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I have hope that that that. I, too, a, a, a simple, uh, everyday person, um, can be changed by you. And I'm so grateful for that. Lord, I pray that you will continue to grow your relationship with each person that's watching right now, that you will um, be with them and, and that same fire and passion that, that you put um, at, at Pentecost, that, that, you, that when the Holy Spirit came on um, all the apostles in that room, I pray that you will um, put that same fire in us, in the believers today, Lord, that, that we would be on fire for you and realize that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter um, anything. It doesn't matter our political perspectives. It doesn't matter um, anything on this earth is all secondary to you. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, have a phenomenal week, and uh, we'll see you next time.